Well, hello everybody. Welcome to this live question and answer session for the first of our for the first day of our Raw Summit conference. What a fabulous day we've had. Um, I hope every one of you has been watching every one of those speakers because they're absolutely brilliant. I re-watched them several times and uh, I'm blown away by the amount of information we have received today. And we're going to answer a few questions that you may have regarding those talks today. But first of all, let me first of all thank Raw Summits for or, or the Summits people themselves for inviting me to be host for this wonderful summit. Uh, great honour. And as everybody who knows me knows, this has been a passion of mine for many, many years. So it's great to be here with you all. Uh, let me thank you for turning up and watching this summit. That's fantastic. And keep watching because there's more to come. And who else do we want to thank? We want to thank, uh, of course, we want to thank our speakers. Thank you so much for taking the time and the effort to participate in this Raw Summit. And also, let me thank our major sponsor, which is Hair Today. Now, here's a, um, there's a link there or a guide to where you can go and see Hair Today. These are wonderful people. They're raw feeders. They supply raw food. For what I can say, they rescue dogs. They are doing a great job. So can I urge you, because they're supporting raw, can you support them if you're able? And of course, it's going to be to your benefit to um, use any of their products that are going to assist you in your uh, quest to be a raw feeder and to do it well for the health of your dog. Now, just very quickly, who did we see today? Well, we started off with my very good friend, Nick Thompson, Dr. Nick Thompson from the UK. Now, Dr. Nick, uh, his session today was to be about um, why we should ditch the raw, but he gave us a whole lot more uh, information than that. Um, Dr. Nick, uh, well, he gave us a great description first up of how he feeds raw. And, you know, just watching that, if you haven't ever fed raw before, suddenly you're going to get the feeling for the way to do this. And Nick gives it to us beautifully. Um, he made the very strong emphasis, and I'm looking at my notes now. I've got, I've taken copious notes. I was like any other student taking copious notes. And, um, of course, he emphasised the fact that when we feed raw, it should be food-based. Um, what else did he tell us to do? Uh, he, he talked about the benefits of switching to raw. And, of course, um, he went right through those, uh, right from the, uh, the first improvements that you're going to see, like uh, healthy skin and coat, better teeth, better movement and all those things. I mean, once you watch these people, including Nick and all the others, you suddenly realise why it is so bad to be feeding kibble, why it's so important to be feeding raw. Uh, he spoke about uh, some of the things, and not, he certainly didn't get to speak to all of them about raw because I kept interrupting him and getting him to speak about side issues, which is so important. But he did speak about the toxins in raw, things like glyphosate um, and so on. And what he came down to, I asked him right at the end, I said, what are your main tips, Nick, for, for, for people out there? So, and I do urge you to watch it again and again. He said, don't be afraid. So many people are afraid of raw. Keep it simple and feed a variety. Those are, those are very important tips. And I know they sound simple in themselves, but they are so true. They're not just trite tips. And he said also reminded us to have a friend with us who's a bit more knowledgeable about raw if we're uncertain. That's a great idea. Somebody's already doing it. And that could be, uh, well, it just could be anybody. But as long as you need, if you need a friend, find one because there's plenty out there, plenty online. Now, our next speaker was Dr. Connor Brady, my very good friend from Ireland. Of course, I give Connor a hard time because he talks so much, but he's a brilliant speaker. And look, if anybody was to put you off feeding kibble, it would be Connor. So watch him again if you haven't watched him. If you have watched him, watch Connor again. Uh, he spoke of the fact that carbohydrates are so useless and so damaging, um, the inflammation they cause, so much more. Uh, he spoke about the diseases directly attributable to um, carbohydrates. And now this is not only all the degenerative diseases, but very specific problems like bloat and pancreatitis and, of course, cancer, the big one, the horrible one. But they're all horrible and they're all based 
in feeding inappropriate foods to our dogs, that terrible kibble, mostly. He then spoke about protein. And again, how kibble contains terrible protein that actually causes problems. And finally, he spoke about the fats in, 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 um, in our food that we feed our dogs and emphasised the point they must be fresh. Now, if you, if you buy kibble, you are buying food that's been cooked three, four, five times. My goodness, this is such damaging material. And we wonder why vets are filled up with people in their waiting rooms with sick dogs. Um, he spoke of the Brisbane guide dogs whose bills dropped by 80%. This was 200 dogs when they switched to raw. Their vet bills dropped by 80%. You, you can have the same experience by switching to raw. Watch Connor. He was is a most eloquent speaker and he will explain to you just how bad these things are then he talked about the omega-3s and sourcing them and spoke about green lip muscle uh how you can be fooled uh so th that's important to watch if you haven't watched it already and when he got down to the best tip it was very similar to my other friend dr nick thompson which is don't be afraid keep it simple um don't worry about nutrients worry about feeding the right food and look he's um such a brilliant speaker now i couldn't believe i hadn't actually heard joel bars with our third speaker talk now joel is an industry expert he's been in the uh, in the food business feeding dogs raw food for for 20 plus years and he started off a brilliant expose of uh well kibble and and the bad things that, and he explained to us very simply and eloquently let me say about the wolves in a wolf sanctuary that is close to him and he, he explained that and, and this is this is real solid evidence they have records going back 37 years of wolves being kept first on kibble for a long period of time and then on raw when they switch those dogs or the, the wolves, and they're our dog's ancestors, from kibble to raw, huge changes in, appeared. First of all, they were, looked much healthier. Second of all, they lived much longer. Instead of living for, for about 12 to 13 years, they lived up to 21 years. And their muscle mass increased from about 120 pounds on average to 137 on average. Now, that's incredible. That's incredible evidence for the power of raw. And, you know, when I was in the States many years ago talking to people, that's exactly the same thing I heard from people who had fed raw for a long time. Their dogs, like Great Danes, for example, I can remember one lady telling me her Great Danes lived to about 17, 18 years without any major problems and then just quietly passed away. They'd reached the end of their, their use by date, if you will. So, and Joel came up with um, three, well, sorry, four very important things. He spoke about heat damage and hydration, two very basic factors. He spoke about um, the benefits of bacteria. in the in, So he spoke about the microbiome and finally about the importance of enzymes. But me just saying that tells you nothing of the depth of information and the brilliance of that talk. So go back, if you haven't, if you didn't appreciate that, go back and have a look and what Joel had to say, absolutely brilliant. Now, our next speaker was a vet from New Zealand. I think I get that right. Yes, of course. It was, I'm going through my notes here because I took copious notes for all these people. I'm a student too, let me let me tell you, from all these people. Now, Dr. Rebecca Brown, again, an industry vet who's been working with raw food for a long time. And she was there, and she did it brilliantly. She was there to dispel the myths about bugs, bones, and balance. These are the big things that vets are scared of, and vets want to scare you about, and, and what the pet food industry that sells kibble wants you to scare about, telling you that um, the bugs, the bones, and the balance are also impossible and so bad in raw food, they're going to kill your pet. Now, none of that is true, and Dr. Rebecca Brown dispelled this brilliantly so please go back and see her work um again she she described as they all have really uh, how simple it is to feed raw foods and um boy oh boy uh i think what well they're all they're all fantastic and uh, looking at the where, where she finished up um talking about safe bone feeding a lot of people really worry about that 
some people realize that the bacteria are there to be actually not a problem and the balance is easy but they do worry about the bones and she went through that in a brilliant fashion so go back if bones worry you go back but have a look at them all from rebecca now finally we listen to nicole now nicole is a scientist and she's working in the raw uh, research area and really what came out of that talk is very important what's very important is that science can be very confusing if you use modern science to check on raw you can lose your way because getting down deep diving deep into inflammatory markers and all that sort of thing where we don't really have a full understanding of those issues and we're trying to understand them by doing the research doing it with raw food suddenly we find ourselves very confused so a lot of this basic science that, that attempts to study raw because it really doesn't understand raw and doesn't know what questions to ask actually ends up causing people to become more confused than ever and what this boils down to is a simple understanding and that simple understanding when i spoke to um, nicole about this she agreed that populations of dogs that eat raw are healthier have less inflammation less cancer less obesity these are the important things and these are what we call and everybody be, would be familiar with this word epidemiological facts epidemiology a population of dogs eating one way a population of dogs eating another look at the differences the differences are marked so this last one this last one was so important this last talk by nicole to point out just how important it is that we look at the science that actually looks at raw feeding the way it needs to be looked at which is to look at two populations of dogs one fed raw the other fed on kibble one fit one is short-lived with lots of disease the other one is long-lived and rarely needs to see the vet so simple all right let's open this up to questions so what questions do we have out there oh here's a, here's a good one what age do you start giving chicken necks and wings to puppies now i wrote about this in my first book grow your pups with bones and the answer is maybe three to four weeks of age oh that surprises some of you i am sure now what i was talking about was weaning pups when pups are weaned people tend to wean them onto some de dreadful gruel of um, processed dog food setting them up for a lifetime of issues usually some sort of allergies so we don't do that if we're raw feeders. As raw feeders and raw breeders, we start our pups off at three or four weeks of age, throwing in some chicken wings, some chicken necks to them. Now, at this stage, they're getting used to the smell, the taste, the touch. They start to do uh, isometric exercise as they pour at those um, chicken necks and wings, as they fight with their brothers and sisters for them. And indeed, sometimes you have to take mum out of the equation because she wants to fight them for those chicken necks and wings as well but this is getting them ready for a lifetime of eating they may not eat a lot of it at this stage particularly smaller breeds with no teeth larger breeds like rotties and so on with with teeth coming through at three four four weeks of age yes sure they will actually get some nutrition out of it but that's when you start don't be afraid of them you can start at any age basically any age and they will start to get the idea that this is what they should have now you can if you wish um feed them ground up so if you want your puppies to actually ingest some of these if they have the teeth three to four weeks of age don't grind them at that right maybe grind them at about six weeks of age and then then you can start to add in other things but read my book gray pups with bones because i i talk about this in some detail but we can start very early so don't be afraid all right do we have another question does adding diatomaceous earth in food and Chinese herbs and supplements nullify or inter... Does adding diatomaceous earth in food together with the Chinese herbs and supplements nullify or interfere with the herbs and supplements? You know, I have no idea. I've never done it. Um, diatomaceous earth, of course, carries a lot of benefits. And so do the Chinese herbs and supplements when properly applied. I would suspect if you're concerned, feed them separately. Because remember, with raw foods, we're not concerned to make each meal complete and balanced. We are concerned to make the entire diet complete and balanced. 
So if you're concerned, feed them separately in separate meals. Okay, very simple. Any more questions? Which raw bones for small dogs? Well, bones that they can't choke on. That's the important thing. Bones that they can't swallow down. So it must be something that they can actually get hold of, rip and tear, and gradually pull apart. But once they get used to eating them, then virtually any size. It's, it's when you're first introducing bones that you have a problem. But for our dogs, we've, we've always had small dogs from poodles, um, and currently we have a cochlear who weighs a little bit too much, but in at around 16 kilos. She has chicken necks and wings constantly. So they're, they're ideal for small dogs. In fact, they're ideal for most dogs, um, particularly as a starting one. But yeah, just chicken, chicken necks, chicken wings, absolutely brilliant. Can you feed flaxseed to your dog for omegas? Good question. You can, but flaxseed comes with the omega-3s. It's, it's rich in omega-3s that are not ready to be used. Then they're inactivated and the body has to activate them. Now, if you have a young, healthy dog, they, they will have the enzymes able to activate those omegas in the flaxseed. If you have an old sick, sick dog, you are better off if you're looking for omegas to add some fish oil from a healthy source, of course, preferably wild, obviously from very cold water fish and free of heavy metals, so from a very good source. But so, and of course, flaxseed has other benefits other than omegas. So it, you can still add flaxseed um, to your dog's diet. Don't add too much. You, you, you might get your dog uh, having the runs because of the oil that in there. Um, so you gradually build up over time. It's very anti-cancer, for example, and a wonderful fibre. And the oils have other benefits other than omegas. So yes, but again, let me caution, if your dog is sick, you're better off to use fish oil. Or if your dog has a severe arthritic problem, for example, again, use the activated form of the omega-3. Next question. In the USA, how do we know which meat sources are best? Well, Sadly, I don't live in the USA, but what you have to look for are things that are organic and grass fed. So you want things, we want meat sources where the animal has been ethically raised. And, and look, if we can support our regenerative farmers and these people look to the earth, they are, they are looking to the, the soil. And this is the foundation of all health, good soil. And we sadly are depleting our soils right around the world today with monoculture farming and throwing in artificial fertilizers. We need regenerative farms that, that build up the soil and from that good soil then produce healthy animals. These are the sorts of animals we should look to to feed. Now, if you, but however, let me say this, if your choice is between feeding kibble and some factory farmed animal, the factory farmed animal is still going to be far healthier, let me assure you, to feed to your dog than kibble because there are so many problems with kibble. It is just so bad. Um, there is no comparison. But it, the more you can go to the top, that is, the more you can go to a regener regeneratively farmed, biodynamically farmed, organically farmed, um, pesticide free farmed, all of those things then you are going for the, the absolute best. Um, we, but we all of us can only do what we can do. And of course, money comes into it as well. So we have to do what we can afford. But my greatest urge is get away from kibble and start feeding real food to your dogs, real food. Now, cooked human food, balanced according to evolutionary norms, is far better than any kibble, let me assure you. And... Go back to my first book, Give Your Dog a Bone. That's the basis of true health for our dogs because they're scavengers and they love or they need raw meaty bones as the basis of their diet. So, but, but I think that just take note that um, organically, regeneratively farmed, biodynamically, all of those, those are the best sources. I was very intrigued by Joel Bard Street's presentation yes it was a brilliant presentation so you have an itchy dog and never considered leaky gut 
Is there an easy way to determine if you are truly dealing with allergies or leaky gut? Well, the point is that the leaky gut is allowing those allergies to form. And, you know, early in my days as a vet, and, and, and um, God formed me or I formed myself as a very lazy person, I discovered that we don't really have to always work out exactly what's going on, but we have to look. There is a cause. And the cause of these problems is, in most instances, the food we are feeding. Now, whether it's through leaky gut or whether it's through some other uh, method that this allergy is occurring, in some ways it doesn't matter. Change the diet. Get them off the carbs. Get them off the damaging foods that are causing these problems. Start feeding a source of healthy bacteria. So some fermented foods. Start feeding a whole food raw diet based on evolutionary principles. So the biggies, bones, meat, organ meats, and then look to other things like eggs, um, cottage cheese, small amounts of things like um, kelp. So we're, these are all described in my books, of course, but get them off the kibble, no matter what you do. Because some people say, oh, well, I'll just feed maybe 30% kibble because it says on the packet that it's got everything a dog needs. Oh. Goodness gracious. Of course it doesn't. That's why there so many dogs are sitting in vets' waiting rooms. Get them off that. That stuff is not good for your dog. I, I've i seen dogs who just eat, and I'll tell you this for sure, who just eat a few chicken wings and just straight mince. And for the most part, these are brilliantly healthy dogs. Oh, and, and the healthy human food scraps. Now, it's uh, anybody who was trying to balance up uh, even a raw food diet would say, well, that's unbalanced. Sure. I recognize it as such, but I also recognize these dogs, and this is the true point, are living long lives and very healthy lives. So raw food by itself, and this is the, what, what I discovered early on, that those raw meaty bones are in fact very close to a complete and balanced diet. And I'm talking about things like chicken wings and chicken necks. Get them off that kibble. That's the answer to these allergies. Um, and then if there is a still a problem, you may have to start looking at specific proteins. But for the vast majority of cases, you don't. The allergies just disappear. And that's the good news. And of course, Joel just talked about some of the mechanisms by which this can happen. But the bottom line is keep it simple. Get them off kibble, feed them raw. So simple. Now, a dog who's missing most of his teeth on one side of his mouth and and more on the other side. <laughs> I don't know whether that's more missing or more there. It doesn't really matter. Vet says no bones to avoid breaking, to avoid breaking. Eating raw, being grinding smaller, not enough. Please, your advice, being grinding smaller. Well, ground up bones. Yes, that's the way to feed dogs with no teeth. Gr grind the bones up. Now, dogs are gulpers. They will gulp their food down. That's what they do, particularly when they're hungry. So, yeah, grind them up. I, I'm not sure whether you're having a problem grinding them smaller, but grind them as small as you can. Um, you can buy, if, you, if you've if you got a commercial mincer, and they're not that dear to make your own food. You just get a very small plate and put it through and uh, those those grinders. So you, you can get away. I, I've bought one here in Australia for... 400 Australian dollars, it's a, it's a brilliant grinder. And it, it's got two, two plates, a, a larger plate and a smaller plate. I tend to use the larger plate and that's fine for chicken wings and necks and chicken feet and so on. Um, but feed dogs with tooth, teeth problems on bones that have been ground up. That's all you need to do. Mix it in, make some bath patties. Now, of course, my books describe that. And if you want to know more about that, um, I'm going to actually cut be conducting a master class after this and we'll talk about exactly i'll probably show you a video i've put together or am putting together of me making the food from ground up bones but uh, dogs with no teeth bath patties works perfectly well so um and don't worry what happens is with raw fed dogs because there's no carbohydrates rushing into into the um stomach with the food that food produces a very strong acid, which actually is the first part of dissolving those bones and releasing the calcium and the protein and everything else from the bones to be utilized by your dog. So there's no problem there. 
Now, the other thing is, of course, our older dogs don't need as much bone as a young growing dog. That's quite simple because they're not making their bones. And I've, I've actually seen dogs with very few raw meaty bones. They might get them once, once a month even. And most of the rest of the time was just raw food and, and, and table scraps. And these dogs lived a very long time. Again, because our dogs are so able as scavengers to get what they need out of the food they eat, so long as it is raw and is roughly in the ballpark of the balance that we require. So don't worry too much about those um, bone chips. Get them as small as you can. Mix them up with the other foods. Your dog will gulp them down. There should not be a problem. I have three dogs. All, I think, at different stages. I buy bulk mincemeat and bones. How can I make sure they are getting all the nutrients they need? <laughs> organ meat. You're missing organ meat there. Um, so we want yes and we're going to you're going to buy different meat so i don't know what what uh, bulk meat you're buying i'm assuming it's beef but you can also go for pork you can go for turkey you can go for for um chicken you, you can go for any species of bird or animal you wish and have it minced up look for some source of soft bones that's usually from young animals the, the simplest and cheapest of course is chicken wings and necks so a raw meaty bone with, with the hydroxy appetite to supply calcium and phosphorus, a raw meaty bone uh, together with the marrow, the meat to provide the essential amino acids, and the bone marrow, which actually supplies a lot of essential fatty acids. That is almost a complete diet in itself, but throw in some organ meat, throw in some crushed raw vegetables for phytonutrients, very protective and very helpful against cancer. If you've got the, the uh, chicken necks and wings, you're putting in cartilage, which is brilliant for their own joints. And it's also anti-cancer. But you feed just those rough ballpark figures and your dog will get out of those what your dog needs. But variety is important. Make sure you're feeding raw meaty bones. Make sure you're feeding organ meats. Um, and you can throw in things like eggs. You can throw in things like cottage cheese. All of these will be great. A little bit of kelp for those minerals. Remember, kelp is comes from the sea, all the, all the um, micronutrients have been washed into the sea, the kelp picks them up, feeds them back to your dog. You do this and you don't have to worry. You're feeding real food. And I'm going to ask you, uh, Marianne, do you have an Excel spreadsheet for yourself? And if you're a, a mum, do you have it for your kids? I don't know you, darling. So, But let me show you, I, I would almost guarantee you don't. Our dog is no different to us. If you're feeding kibble, that stuff is so poor nutritionally and so inappropriate because our dogs can hardly utilise it to get the nutrients they need. It has to be, well, well, actually, more, more for legal reasons, it has to be complete and balanced, but it's not biologically complete and balanced. Feed food, keep it simple, and your dog will get all the nutrients it needs. It really is that simple. And if you're really concerned, join my masterclass afterwards where we will go into that in more depth. Next question, please. Hi. Hi. Hi, Vicky. What are your top three foods to add to raw or non-raw even, please, for protecting kidneys from disease? Ah, well. Well, the first thing I'm going to add is take out the non-raw particularly if it's kibble. How do we protect kidneys from disease? You don't feed kibble. Because the disease we're seeing in our organs comes about from inappropriate food. Every organ disease, including kidney, is based on inflammation and toxic foods. The toxins produced by fats that are being cooked to death and oxidised. The toxins produced when the proteins have been cooked five times and have combined with carbohydrates to produce these advanced glycated end products that block up your kidneys, wreck them completely. Get them off the kibble. Number one, protection. Stop the kibble. Number two, feed a balanced raw whole food diet. Number three, stop worrying. They're my top three tips. You've got to just give. 
it's a bit like saying I'm going to put crook. Oh, that's an Australian expression. I'm going to put bad fuel in my car. Okay, that's because it's cheap. I'm going to put that in. What are three additives I can put in to somehow nullify that? You can't. The simple answer is put in the right fuel in the first place. That's simple. It is simple. We, we're all making it too complicated. This is the point. Okay, hope that helps. Michelle, hi, Michelle. We've been in constant contact for the last day or so. Hi, Dr. Ian. What do you get people to replace rice and sweet potato with? Answer, I don't know what the rest of your question is because I haven't read it. Real food. Um, this is for clients of mine who aren't feeding kibble anymore, but they still haven't quite got the full raw diet message of carbs aren't neat. Well, if they want carbs, they have to buy themselves a juicer. And they have to go down to, I don't care whether it's Aldi or Woolworths or Coles or the local farmer's market and buy a whole heap of carrots, maybe some apples, maybe some mangoes if they can get hold of them, maybe any of the cruciferous vegetables, maybe a little bit of celery. Put them through the juicer. Then you're going to have carbs and you're going to recombine the juice and the pulp and suddenly you've got a really healthy base, a carbohydrate base for those dogs. Now, of course, I know what they're talking about. They're, they want to feed um, starch to their dogs. They want to feed sugar. They have. I'm, I'm sorry, but there is no replacement except what I've just described to you. We do not, dogs do not need root vegetables. They do not need grains. They did not evolve to eat those things. It's the wrong fuel. It's the wrong spare parts. You just can't fix it. <laughs> by adding a few other things go the whole hog feed the real thing so but if you if they want to feed carbs then do what i just described if they have to feed something well pumpkin and sweet potato cooked are probably the best of all and include the skin skin's beautiful do you have baked pumpkin and that sort of thing well baked pumpkin skin is absolutely wonderful but anything uh, like that is, is important because it's got all those wonderful colored things the polyphenols so they're important uh, maybe even some uh, some beet beetroot. I hope that helps. Um, I I am not very sympathetic for people who want to feed carbs to their dogs. I I believe it's actually cruel, because it promotes inflammation, and it's cruel to promote inflammation in your dog. It's cruel to promote cancer. It's cruel to promote arthritis. It's cruel to promote kidney disease. It's cruel to your dog. So, I don't condemn people for that because most people just don't understand. But once I tell them, then it's up to them, of course, if they want to do that to their dog, the dog that, that, that cares for them, for them and depends on them. This is a choice we all have to make. And, and, and I'm empowering you with this information, but I'm also giving you a hard, a hard give you something hard because I'm kept telling you the truth and then you have to make up your mind what you want to do. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> hope that answers your question. Next question. Considering progress so far, do you believe there will ever be a time when major vet schools change official attitudes towards raw feeding? Hmm. This is what I've been pushing for for a long time. But what we've got is the exact opposite currently. As I pushed harder with my writings, my lectures, and, and, and advised people to do the same, the major pet food companies has, have pushed back harder. And we have young, impressionable vet students uh, coming out of vet school with the knowledge, brilliant knowledge in medicine, drugs, surgery, pathology, microbiology, all the basics of being a vet. One area that they don't realise they're being taught so badly in is nutrition because it's being taught by the major pet food companies who tell them, that bacteria in the raw food will kill the dogs, that all raw food is unbalanced and the bones are dangerous. So our young, impressionable young students come out of vet school with some great knowledge in everything else except nutrition. And, and sadly, nutrition is the foundation of health and that very area where they should be absolutely proficient, they're told, well, look, certainly 
you don't have to worry about nutrition because it's all taken care of with the processed pet foods that you are going to recommend and do make sure they never feed raw food. By the way, that's a great business model. I am hoping that eventually some vet schools will start to realise that pet food is like the cigarettes in the medical area. A long time ago, the medical profession used to advocate cigarettes as healthy. They were all doctors and nurses and so on used to smoke. They all ended up with cancer and all sorts of problems. Eventually, I believe, the penny will drop. But the problem is money speaks louder than truth. That's the problem. So until we as a nation of pet owners become schooled in the understanding of how important it is to feed our dogs a raw diet, a diet they were devised, uh, evolved or uh, constructed, um, produced by evolution to require until we come to that understanding and we start walking with our feet away from processed pet foods and start forcing these people to actually produce real healthy food, it's going to stay the way it is. It's up to us. And I've been saying that for a long time as well. So I'm saying it again. I hope you're listening out there. Thank you. Can supermarket wings be good to give or do they need to be organic? Now, I did talk about that earlier and I did stress that supermarket wings are absolutely fine compared to kibble. Absolutely brilliant. Um, 10,000 times better. Add another dimension to that and make them organic better again. And that's the answer. So don't feed kibble because there's only supermarket wings available. Use those. But sniff them, make sure they're not off. But mind you, our dogs can handle that as well. But, I, well, in our family, we do prefer to feed our dogs with food that isn't starting to go off and rancid. And sometimes those supermarket wings, they might have been frozen, unfrozen. So to just check them out if they're slimy or off. Well, walk with your feet, go to another supermarket. But they're okay. They're okay. Where can we buy your books? Um, well, in the States, it's... Um, oh, I'm just trying to think. Um, I'll come back to that. You can go to my website and buy them. and that's. But it's a bit expensive for the States. Um, Oh, I can't. Oh, oh, there's a, there's a couple of places in the states you can actually get them on Amazon, actually, but you can't get grow your pups with bones in the states. Um, oh, let me come back to you with that. <laughs> um, no, I ca I can't think of the company. It's uh, and I should know it really well because we've been dealing with them for a long time. That that shows you. Uh, what's it? I think it shows you my age. Anyway, uh, but off my website they're available. And oh my goodness, um, it's a the dog. It's no, I can't think of it. Come back to it. I, I will think of it. It'll come to me as we're talking about something else. Sorry, Keisha. Should puppies under six months be given garlic? Well, we're feeding our dog food to puppies under six months. Oh, this is the dog food that um, I devised here in Australia, Doctor B's Buff. Um, and it's it's always had garlic in it. Now it's only at a very small level. It's very a very safe level. I haven't had any problems with puppies being fed that. If you're worried, you know, unless you had a specific reason to give it, don't give it. If you're worried, see this is this is another thing. If you're worried, something really worries you, like like that, you can leave it out. Then when six months comes, if you feel comfortable giving it, then you can give small amounts probably about 0.5% of the overall diet mixed in as a complete meal. So 0.5% of that. You're not giving a complete clove of garlic to your dog once a week or something. Don't do that because that can be toxic. But garlic, like, I mean, if you give too much salt, it's toxic. If you give too much water, that too is toxic. They use water torture, as we know. Um, so everything is can be toxic in the wrong amounts. Even protein as a sole diet is toxic. So, and, and feeding one thing like liver for an entire diet, that too 
in a sense, is toxic and that creates disease. So we don't do that. We think we, we, where we understand that things like garlic can be problematic, then we feed them to, to the amount within the diet that is not problematic. And we always use common sense. And if something like garlic worries you before six months of age, now I've used it in puppies, certainly, because thousands of puppies have eaten the product we produce, um, then no, no problem at all. But if you're worried, that's something you can safely leave out without any great issues, okay? What are your thoughts on number of times to feed per day? I currently feed my dogs once at dinner time, though they may have kefir or almighty burns earlier in the day. All right, there are some very, very good studies now that suggest that once feeding a day is important for dogs. And there's some very good reasons for that. And not only feeding once a day, but feeding randomly throughout the day. So your dog never knows when that meal is going to turn up. And this is, in a simplistic fashion, this is based on evolutionary norms. You see, if we think about it, a wolf in the wild or even a feral dog living out in the wild does not is not sitting in a situation where there will be a rabbit turn up at four o'clock in the afternoon and another one turn up, say, at seven o'clock in the morning. That's not the way it works. Sometimes the dog will be eating, or the wolf might be eating insects throughout the day or a mouse. Or sometimes that wolf, together with a pack, may have brought down a, an entire animal and then gorged on that, and then not eaten for two or three days. On my wall, um, back in my first ever clinic, there was a sign that said, there's only one rule in life. There are no rules. You see, rules are devised for people who have no understanding of something. So you bank a rule up, say, well, if you don't understand how to do this, then to, to be safe, do it this way. But if you understand principles, then you can break all the rules you like because you know that it's okay. No Disaster is not going to fall on your dog's head if you feed it twice a day. They won't do as well, it turns out, and there's studies to show this, if you feed them consistently twice a day at exactly the same time. Dogs are a little bit different to us in that they are designed to have one huge meal and even an empty tummy, once it has emptied, is not exactly hunger. It's just an empty tummy for a dog. Sure, they'll eat if you offer them food. But the whole waiting for food, that whole situation where a dog knows it's going to be fed at four o'clock and they have brilliant time clocks built into them, their body then starts to prepare for that food. Now, if it doesn't turn up and you don't feed them till six, they can actually be quite sick because of all that acid and enzymes pouring into their stomach in preparation for that food to arrive. But if they don't know when the food is going to arrive, that never happens. And in uh, my book, my first book, Give Your Dog a Bone, I talked about, and I didn't quite understand why, but I knew that that's what we did and that's what happened in the wild, the importance of not feeding regularly. And also knew the importance of a, a fast now and again. And it turns out that fast now and again, which some dogs do naturally now when they're raw fed, actually helps things like the mitochondria to regenerate. So it helps the body to regenerate. And it's a healing process within the body. So it's a, a guard against aging. So number of times to feed per day, ideally, yes, once, and some days, zero. But don't feel bad if, you're, if your dog eats some treats in between or, or whatever. There are no rules. Just understand what you do most of the time is what sets your dog up for either health or illness. Gail, my dog is raw fed, but is sensitive to white fish. Can you recommend a plant-based omega-3? Hmm. Is salmon a white fish? I don't know. Uh, is, she, is she sensitive to uh, um, fish oils? Maybe, I don't know. Look, if your dog is young and healthy, as I said earlier, 
Sure, flaxseed is absolutely fine, as is hemp seed, which is a more balanced form of omega-6 and omega-3s. But I think um, any of the chlorellas and some of these um, algal-based type of supplements are now very good, and they too have high levels of activated omega-3. So that may be the way to go. But I don't have experience with that. I think one of our speakers either has or will speak about that. So watch out for that. Um, it may have been Dr. Connor. I think it was. It may have been, but I'm not sure. No, no, no. No, I think it was. No, I think it's yet to come. I think it's 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 the it's a speaker on day two, but uh, she, she speaks more about that. But it's yeah, the algal uh, forms because they're the tiny um, phytoplankton, which make these omega threes. Brilliant sources, very healthy. Um, yeah, so look look for those and see how you go. But mind you, having said that. Do you need extra omega threes? Is your dog young and healthy and eating? Say, um, well, omega three is present in most animals that are grass fed and organically raised. So there may be enough in those to keep your dogs doing exactly what they need to do. I don't regularly feed my dogs omega threes as a supplement. I depend on the food they're eating. So think about that as well. But if you need to supplement. Yeah, that, that's the way to go. Those those plant-based, those um, algal forms. What do you think about packaged, air-dried, raw dog foods? Depends on, well, okay. Depends on the temperature at which they were air-dried. And so, like freeze-drying, for example, is pretty well close to retaining most of the enzymes and most of the goodness. If air drying was at a higher temperature, then maybe it won't retain as much. So maybe you need to speak to the manufacturer about that. But sure, pretty good. Pretty good if it's real food that has been air dried, not air dried kibble, for example. It's all air dried kibble, isn't it? It's, it's just dry. Um, yeah, and just to speak to the manufacturer. How is their process? Is it a really high temperature? Is the temperature enough to kill the enzymes? and some of the goodness in that food and denature it. So is it close to cooking or is it actually close, closer to being raw? Got to be better than kibble, though, that's for sure. Should vegetables be cooked or raw? Ah, great question. Let's go back to evolution. What happens in evolution? Well, not a wolf out there or a dingo, for that matter, in Australia that has a stove and a pot and is able to get water in that pot and boil up some veggies or fry them. So the quick answer is raw, but how do you prepare them? That's the big question. Well, let's go back to evolution and nature and what happens in the real world again. Well, we have things called cows and sheep and deer. These are all ruminant animals and they do a thing called chewing their cut. So they eat lots of grass, they spend most of their day eating grass, picking it up, swallowing it down into their rumen, first stomach, where it undergoes a process of fermentation. But they do something else. They regurgitate that food and chew it up. And by chewing it up, they break down every cellulose cell wall that surrounds the contents of each cell within that plant material. We have to mimic that. The best way to mimic that, apart from the fermentation part, is and we can add fermented foods to our dog's food as well to mimic that bit but the best way to utilize raw foods and they have this has to happen or our dogs don't utilize them as nutrition is to put them through a juicer and i mentioned this earlier recombine the juice and the pulp and i'm talking about above, above ground ones here i'm not talking about starchy root vegetables although i yes carrots we can include here definitely because of their beta carotene uh, they're a great source of fiber as well so yes i am talking about those but we put them through a juicer so we might have cabbage and celery and broccoli and apples and, and, and carrots all mixed together we could drink the juice ourselves some of it we could re combine some of that juice with the pulp but what are we feeding now we're feeding food that mimics the gut contents of a herbivore 
It's been thoroughly ground up. Each cellulose cell wall that surrounded each cell has been broken down. That cellulose now becomes available for the um, bacteria in the large bowel to work on. It's a prebiotic. Oh, we've all heard of that word. It's sort of taken on modern parlance, but it's been there for a long time, been there forever. We just put a word on it now. Plus the contents now, which are absolutely brilliant, the cell contents, which were guarded from your dog's digestive system before you put them through the juicer, now they're available to be digested and form wonderful nutrition. Anti-cancer, for example. Uh, Pro-health in every way for your dog. So raw and ground up through a juicer. That's the answer. Most whole animal ground proteins come frozen. If you're making bar patties from the defrosted protein, is it okay to refreeze the patties? Yes, absolutely, all the time. Just keep them at a low temperature. That's the important thing. Uh, it's called, in, in the business, it's called tempering them. So uh, why, why that is so, I don't know. I don't think we're making them angry, but uh, we might be. But it's called tempering them. So you just get them to the point. And in fact, if you're making frozen patties yourself and you have an industrial machine, an industrial grinder, that industrial grinder will work better if they're just slightly frozen. It'll put them through much better. So that ensures that you keep them at a low temperature. So work keeping everything at a low temperature, work quickly, and that is absolutely fine. Freezing them is good because in, a, in lots of ways, one, it gets rid of any pathogens, um, helminth pathogens, that's worms, such as in Australia, I doubt it's. Um, and secondly, it starts to break the cells down. So it actually starts the digestive process, like, like, like using the juicer for plant material. So yes, not a problem, so long as you keep the temperatures low, and you're going to do that anyway if you're making patties and grinding them yourself. We've got the ratios at what to feed, 80, 10, 10. But how much should we be feeding dogs daily according to their weight? Well, that ratio is absolute rubbish. That's, that's number one. No, I don't know who came up with that I, uh, and why we all stick to it. It's got no validity. And, and you'd wonder uh, if you go into Yellowstone National Parks where wolves were reintroduced, to, is there somebody out there that's ensuring that those wolves stick to an 80 10 10 ratio i doubt it very very much so that's that's number one so how much should we be feeding our dogs daily according to their weight well we actually are going to feed them according to their lifestyle the, t the uh, temperature prevailing their activity their age how do you work all that out you feed enough food to maintain them at whatever weight you want them to be at. Now, I suggest to people that the ideal weight for a dog is a dog, the weight that if it's been raised on raw food in a healthy way, around about two to three years of age, it's, it's reached its mature size, maybe three years. That's the weight and the size you should keep it at. After that, maybe four to five years of age, we see fat creeping on in most dogs today mainly because they've been fed kibble and it goes straight to fat, any excess. But if you can maintain your dog's weight at that level, then you feed enough food to maintain that. And only you can determine that. Sure, it may be anywhere between 2% of body weight and 7% of body weight. Who knows? I doubt that it'll be 7% unless it was a dog in the Iditarod racing to the North Pole or wherever it is they race up there. I've never actually been. Heard about it. But... Horses for courses. Again, it's just common sense. And if your dog is very active and requires a lot more energy, and keeping in mind the energy foods, there's, there's two, only two that we should be feeding. One is protein, the other, the other is fat. You're going to increase the level of fat in the diet. And also the protein if they're very active because they're breaking down muscle tissue. But, hey, again, we'll talk more about that in the master class. But it's common sense. And I actually described all of that and give your dog a bone years ago. People who read that book and just took it up and weren't worried about um, nutritionism, as we're all worried today, and this silly 80-10-10 rule, which has got nothing to do with anything, just made up by somebody and everybody thinks it's, it's uh, come from on high. It hasn't. It's come from on low, I suspect. Anyway, so please don't worry about that. Um, 
we feed enough. And I, my my general recommendation was sixty percent raw meaty bones, right across the board. <coughs> whether you're and and where the bones contained equal amounts of um, bony material, and other things, which could include cartilage, marrow, fat, and meat. Maybe maybe only thirty percent bone. The rest of those th three things, but start to feed that way and throw in some organ meat and then your veggies and uh, maybe some eggs and some healthy human foods grab by george you've got a healthy dog but don't worry about this 80 10 10 it just binds people up and gets them worried and then they say oh we fe we feed 80 uh, percent um was it meat 10 percent bones and 10 percent organs but that doesn't that's does not a complete diet of course it's not well it, it comes close but there are lots of other things you can feed and and not only that the 10% bone, okay for a mature dog, but may not be enough calcium for a growing dog to form its own bones. And you can throw in lots of bones because nobody in the entire history of the dog's evolution ever told dogs, whoops, you're having too much bone, mate. I didn't say that because there was nobody there, there to say that. And dogs are scavengers. So they require more bones than cats, looking at this from an evolutionary point of view. hope that gives you some insight in the way to approach this. The hound healer. Hi. What are your thoughts about rotational feeding? Well, if rotational feeding means feeding a variety of foods, absolutely fine. I think it means something else, and I did come across it. I'm, I think it means not feeding a complete diet at every meal. I suspect that's what it means, and, and that's what I'm in, in favour of. You don't have to do that. It's difficult to achieve, and it ties people up. Um, if we were in a live discussion, I would ask you to describe what you mean by rotational feeding, and I would tell you what I think of it. But I, I suspect that's where, the, uh, where we are landing, that it's variety, and it's not making each meal complete and balanced. And as you would understand by now, absolutely brilliant to, to, to follow that path. Can feeding raw cause a dog to present with elevated liver enzymes as opposed to kibble-fed dogs? We have seen this on a number of occasions. Why is it so? Well, I am suspicious, and I don't know why, but there is some evidence, two things. One, it may be that we still have a leaky gut from the previous carbohydrate-based diet. That may be a reason. The second one is that there's some evidence to show that enzymes from the food can sometimes be absorbed intact and, and play a role in supporting and encouraging anti-aging and, and the dog's health. So you have to marry up those liver enzymes with the state of the dog's health. Um, we always have to be aware of tests that we do. Do they correlate with what we are seeing clinically? Is there some... Is our dog actually sick? Is that indicated by those raised liver enzy enzymes? Or is something else going on? And I don't think we have a full answer to that yet. But yes, I've seen it. And yes, the dogs weren't sick and there were no problems. Uh, but that, again, is something, you know, I'd need to discuss with you in more detail to answer your question fully. But that's the best answer I can give at the moment. What's your opinion on feeding kefir to dogs? Well, as a source of bacteria, healthy bacteria, a great idea. Whether that particular type of bacteria is necessary for your dog is still an open question, but uh, we have seen benefits and, and, and I've certainly done this and I certainly included it in the processed raw food. So we were making raw patties for dogs, but we included kefir as a standard part of that mix because we strongly believe that feeding healthy bacteria is an important part of raw feeding. Now, 
there is no question that the microbiome is far more complex than that. And the microbiome responds to the sort of food you feed. In other words, if you feed a particular sort of food, say carbohydrates, it's going to raise bacteria that you actually don't want in your gut. It's going to, because it's going to feed them. If you feed real food, the food that your dog evolved to require, then it's going to encourage the growth of good bacteria that your dog actually needs for its brain health, its immune health, its digestive health, all those wonderful things that the microbiome does for us and which is so essential to our life and to our dog's life. But we also know that wild dogs have very specific strains of bacteria which are very healing when placed in the guts of uh, sick domestic dogs and, and can often turn help turn them around. But then again, so does the raw food itself as it encourages a better class of healthy bacteria within the gut. So yes, I'm quite happy for kefir to be fed to dogs, but it's not the be all and the end all of fermented foods. You can feed, if they'll eat it, you can feed sauerkraut. And I'm now involved also in a company that makes fermented food. And, and we're very excited about that because we think this is a good way to go to ferment a wide variety of superfoods and then turn them into a dehydrated powder and feed them to our dogs. So, yes, I'm absolutely, this is something actually that we've, um, I've wanted for a long time because I knew it was important. We were feeding vegetables that we crushed up, as I've described earlier today. And I knew the fermentation thing was to some degree missing. So the more we can feed fermented foods as part, not the whole, of a raw food diet, the better off our dogs are going to be. Last question. Okay. Have we reached the end of our time? My goodness, time does fly by. That was the last question. Oh, here we go. How much kelp powder does a four-pound dog require? Oh, dear, not a hell of a lot. Um, I would look at feeding it as, as about, if you're putting it in a meal, no more than about 2% of that meal. It doesn't require a lot because what you're providing is, well, you're providing a bit of iodine and you're also providing micronutrients in that kelp. So not a great deal. Just be very careful. You have to be careful. It's important to add a little bit. And again, we always did add some at about that level to our commercial raw foods, but not too much. Because when you're feeding, and, and again, it also depends a bit on what you're also feeding, whether you're feeding, um, well, fish and other foods that may contain some iodine, then you have to be very careful that you don't overdo it. But again, I doubt that you will overdo it if you're feeding real food, whole food, and you may be supplementing a little bit of kelp at that level, and that's absolutely fine. And again, I would be t tempted if I was feeding a, a four-pound dog to only add it in maybe once or twice a week, just to be sure I wasn't, unless there was a problem. And then, you, then if there's a problem, then you start looking at having your vet do some iodine levels in particular, uh, and looking, at, of course, at thyroxin, levels and um t3 and t4 and alert from no backups for 746 days my computer's talking to me uh so when you have a problem that's when you have to go to a knowledgeable vet who deals in that area and, and dr gene dodds is, is one of them in the states i know that so that uh, this is where you would look for your answers all right i think we have to wrap up for today uh we look forward to tomorrow which is going to be fantastic. And we, I look forward to speaking to you again tomorrow at question time. So thank you again for watching. Thank you for being with me. Thank you for listening. I hope I've been able to help and I'll see you tomorrow.